The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and Freedomslips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, Freedomslips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Cosmic Catastrophe on Revolution.Radio. I am your host, Diamond, from the Oppenheimer Ranch Project. And joining us today is my lovely partner and co-host, Leah Shaper. Hello. Welcome to the program. This is going to be a banger, folks. Mm-hmm. Uh, the title of the show, look at my shirt. Half of it's ironed and half of it's wrinkly. No, oh, I was just noting that I have pet hair all over my fleece, mostly Halo's hair. Like, well, those wow, are nice earrings. What are those? Huh? Where'd you get those earrings? Oh, I don't know. Somebody I know gave them to me. Fantastic. <laughs> My little pea pods. All right. The title of the show today is Cataclysmic Polarity Shift. Is the U.S. national security prepared for the next geomagnetic pole reversal? <laughs> That's a big one. Now, this is a, all from a paper that came out in 2015 that was published at... Uh, the Air University in Montgomery, Alabama. Now, the Air University uh, is was developed to train and educate and develop air and space war fighters in support of the national defense strategy. So this is a military organization. It's headquartered at Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery, Alabama, and is a major component to air education and training command and is the lead agent for Air Force education. So... This isn't like a paper from a community college. Right. I mean, it is a paper that is written um, for the acquisition of a degree. However, it was also made public, probably because the information is useful. Yes. So we're going to dive into that. We might not have time to go through the whole thing. Ding, ding. And that means that they have a lot of information for us to share. Uh did you get to you got to peruse most of the paper? Yeah, I read most of it. Let me share the screen. Before we get started, we need to discuss what we're talking about. So we're talking about the Earth's magnetic field. A polarity reversal is a reversal in the f- magnetic field of Earth, hence the polarity, right? Magnets have a mm-hmm. north and a south. And so does the Earth. The Earth has a north pole and a south pole, and sometimes it flips. Now, this is not the only pole on Earth. I thought you were going to say something. Well, I was, but I didn't even start. You just read my mind. I was just thinking, like, let's be very, very clear here because this often gets mixed up. We are talking about the magnetic pole flip, not the physical pole flip. Yeah, so she's talking about the geographic North Pole, which is the pole by which we spin. So that pole... The geographic North Pole, the geopole, is the Mm -hmm. important one. And that, based on our studies, doesn't move rapidly uh, or very often. Right. Okay, so what we do have is a magnetic pole and a geomagnetic pole. Right. The magnetic pole is the actual pole where North is or South on Earth at any given time. The geopole has to do with residual magnetism in the crust based on where the magnetic pole used to be and is now, and it is an average of all the magnetism and is where if you look at your compass, it points north. Mm -hmm. So when your compass is pointing north, it's not pointing towards the north magnetic pole. That's crazy. It's pointing to the geomagnetic pole, which is the average of all norths. And that geomagnetic sense, right? is what you meant earlier when you said geopole, right? Geomagnetic versus geographic. We we're talking about the geomagnetic pole. Yeah, the geomagnetic pole is shifting. Well, actually, the magnetic poles are shifting, and they're shifting rapidly. Mm-hmm. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, it means a lot of things, and we've gone through multiple peer-reviewed papers on the topic, the most famous of which 
and we may get to it, is the role of geomagnetic field intensity in late quaternary evolution of humans and mammals. And what this paper displays out in the open with amazing graphics is that the biome on Earth is tragically affected during low magnetic field intensity. Right. What I mean by that is there's mass extinctions, uh, there's bottlenecks, but at the same time, it allows for new species to mm -hmm. proliferate. So it's not all bad. It's it's good and bad. Yeah, well, it's it's like a lot of new stuff comes out of destructive forces, right? It's 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 like the Shiva god, right? The 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 god of creation and destruction at the same time, because that's how it works. <laughs> yeah, and now for humans, if this were to happen now, because we are lazy, sedentary. Uh, consumers that stare into squares. If this were to happen, which it's happening now in a more significant way, it will severely affect the way humans live. Right. And, 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 and I would actually argue that the critical issue is that everything that we do is completely centralized, right? We're completely dependent on centralized infrastructure, food distribution, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and those systems are at serious risk uh, during a uh, geomagnetic pole reversal. Yeah. So the paper that we're going to discuss, Cataclysmic Polarity Shift, does a good job at covering in a broad spectrum all of the effects that this could ha that could happen, the information that we know. And I really like this paper in its honesty. When you're reading yeah. it, they are being completely honest. So this is not propaganda. It's not a cover-up. They are literally being honest. And you can hear it in the first 10 pages when they say things like, geologists really don't know. That is science. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, I also just want to throw out their credit where credit is due. Isn't a, didn't a viewer send this paper to you? Yeah, earlier in the week, four or five days ago. And I yeah. I don't want to announce who it was because they might not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just want to say thank you to that viewer for doing that. Which is weird because this has been around so long. How do yeah. we not, how are we this not aware of it? It's almost a decade old now. Right, yeah. and it's available for public consumption. But in my estimation, and we're going to be going on some tangents here, I think that this was suppressed probably. Yes, probably. And and what's interesting about that is that while I agree with you, that this paper is very honest I think it doesn't even really go far enough in term in discussing the the consequences. Like it like it discusses all of the consequences kind of individually, but it doesn't really fully recognize the situation when you look at all of the consequences in totality and the kind of the level of the domino catastrophic effect that this will have. Right, it's more of an introduction to the effects rather than um, an analysis of what would occur. Yeah. 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 And it is, or, or, or to like bring, to bring it to someone's attention who has never really thought about this and you don't want to blow their mind too much because they might just stick their fingers in their ears and walk away. Right. So you're kind of like easing into it a bit. <laughs> so we're going to link you below the video tonight on magnetic reversal news, access to this paper so you can have it and read it for yourself. Cataclysmic polarity shift. Is the U.S. national security prepared for the next geomagnetic pole reversal? Uh, and this is by Tyler J. Williams, captain of the U.S. Air Force. Um, so let's go on and read the abstract. <clears throat> Anything you want to say before we get nope, to the no, meat? Okay. Now, Earth's core is undergoing a dramatic change with geomagnetic field strength dropping by 40% over the last 400 years. Now, this is interesting because this paper is a decade old at this point. Right. <laughs> and so a lot of the numbers are much higher at this point. Yeah. Because what's been revealed to us in the last decade through the World Mag Magnetic Model and other sources is a more of an exponential decrease in the magnetosphere in the last 10 years. Yeah. So we could be down 50% over the last 400 years at this point. I would guess that uh, an exponential decrease in the field strength is pretty typical of a reversal period, right? Because you can sort of imagine how 
that that builds on itself the the less strong that it get the more the more it falls apart if that makes any sense yeah like a cascading destruction yeah a paper just came out that showed that it is the recovery from the reversal that is the fastest so once mm. you reach zero point when it decides to switch back Let's right. say if it's just an excursion, it is the switching back that can happen within hours. That that makes perfect sense too, right? Because it is again exponential on the other side, right? As as the magnetics sort of come more into alignment, there's almost like a snapping of things going back into strong polarity. So the way down in the excursion takes much longer than the snap back. Sure. Okay. And as little as a decade ago, Scientists' perspective on the way down was that these excursions or polarity reversals take thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And there have been several papers in the last decade that have thrown that out the window. In fact, the last magnetic uh, reversal, the Brunus Matayama, it's estimated to have taken less than 100 years for a full polarity reversal. Yeah, well, and this paper acknowledges that as well as the fact that there is not really a consistent time frame for reversals, right? Some of them are really fast, less than 100 years, which for us as human beings is actually quite a long time. And others are longer, that they can be a few hundred years, maybe even a thousand years. And if this excursion started 400 years ago, mm -hmm. we could be in the last few decades of it. Right. So that's what we need to know. Now, the changes that we're seeing are a precursor to a common geologic phenomenon known as geomagnetic polarity reversal, but more commonly excursion. This is where the north and south poles of Earth reverse or appear to be reversing. So it's mm -hmm. one or the other. The mm -hmm. more common is the excursion. So there mm -hmm. are dozens or hundreds of excursions in between polarity reversals. Mm -hmm. Okay. These geomagnetic polarity reversals significantly decrease the strength of Earth's magnetic field, thereby considerably increasing the interaction of solar wind with the Earth's atmosphere and biosphere. So what that means in layman's terms is we're going to get more geomagnetic storms, more aurora, more beached whales, and other wacky stuff. I would argue that to birds some falling from the sky, you know? Right, right. I would argue to some degree we've already seen that, right? Like you and I have noted privately at various times when there's a solar event of some kind that's kind of minimal, it seems to be affecting, let's say, the KP index more severely than we expected. Right. And we've seen aurora to low latitudes with minor events. Right. So the, we have physical evidence that the Earth's magnetic field is weakening and we can observe it. Mm -hmm. Okay, now the purpose of this research in this paper was to answer if the United States is prepared for the impacts to national security resulting from the next geomagnetic polarity reversal. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I read that, I said, absolutely not. Right. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even yeah. have to read the paper. Right, of course. <laughs> so. We already have minor issues with telecommunications during geomagnetic storms and other things, but we have not yet to see an event like the Carrington event in our lifetime. And when that happens, um, the entire planet is going to be well aware how woefully prepared we are. Unprepared. Yes. <laughs> well, I said woefully prepared. That means unprepared. Doesn't it? I'm uh, not sure that it does, but anyway, we could argue the grammar later. <laughs> <laughs> so this report begins with an overview on pole reversals. So we'll show you those charts. And then it evaluates the effects of reversals on United States national security by utilizing six evaluation criteria, ranging from infrastructure areas, such as the electrical power grid, to national response capabilities. And the research also evaluates the impacts of increase in solar and cosmic radiation and the threat of adverse space weather during this polarity transition on the United States security. <clears throat> now the research concluded, guess what? That the nation is not <laughs> prepared for both <laughs> geomagnetic polarity reversals and the subsequent adverse space weather. Furthermore, the nation has neglected funding for geoscience and geomagnetism research, 
all the money is going to scientism and man-made global warming. Which I'll just throw out there and we'll get to it, but there's a couple of little references to, it, it would seem to reference the kind of ridiculousness of how much funding we put into global warming research when it's not even proven. <laughs> right, not a single paper. <laughs> but what we do know is that the polarity reverses and if it happens, it's bad things happen, but we're not preparing for that. Well, I, I, actually, I'll just throw it out there now. But I'm, I'm jumping ahead in the paper a little bit here, but it's just one sentence. Unlike the debate surrounding man-made climate change and global warming, polarity reversals are a proven natural phenomena that have occurred hundreds of times in the Earth's past and will happen again in the future. So they're like, hello, this is a certainty that this will happen at some point. So why don't we pay attention to this instead of all this other bullshit? It leads you back to like Donald Rumsfeld when we're at war and he's like, mm -hmm. there's the known unknowns, the unknown knowns and the, un the known unknown knowns. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we got going on here. And so I think I wanted to get to this at the end, but it's so obvious here. Everyone's been asking the question, you know, does the, does the government know what's happening? Yeah. Of course they do. And right. there's no way they can tell the public because everyone will run around like maniacs. Yeah. 80% of the pop of the population, they don't have an inner monologue. That's crazy. So <laughs> how are they even going to panic? Right. 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 Well, and that's, I mean, we'll get to this, but that's kind of the other thing. Like not only are we woefully unprepared, but Sadly, I believe that I don't think that there is any amount of preparation that the U.S. government can or will do that can actually prepare for this adequately. Like, I don't think that's even possible. Well, I would counter that with they are already prepared. They're not prepared to save humanity. Right. They right. have deep underground military bases that have their own power stations, own nuclear reactors, hard in communication. They are going they are going to be fine. It's the rest of us that aren't. Right. Yeah. Right. Like and and you have to consider that when you look at the billionaires who are building their own bunkers, right? Like I'm not going to say that I can read those people's minds, but um, it's quite possible that people that are sort of that high up in the food chain have government connections that tell them that this is coming. And they're like, oh, shit, I better do something. Yeah. And some of them have even Bezos has not only a bunker, but a rocket launch pad. So if he needed to leave <laughs> Earth for two or three days and then come back when it's safer, he has options. Right. Right. That's yeah. Right. And that's People really like, the only reason What happens if you're going to launch yourself into space? You're going to starve up there. Be like, no, you just need to leave for a few days until it calms down. So that's what I was about to say. The only reason to actually leave the planet that makes any sense, considering that there's nowhere to go, right? There's nowhere to go where you're going to be able to survive. So the only reason to have a rocket launcher is to be able to leave for a couple of days. So what does that tell you about what he's preparing for? Wait, Basically. I heard there are blue chickens on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, this reason, uh, where are we? Yeah. So, based on the conclusions, and I love this, this research recommends increasing geoscience and geomagnetism funding, spearheading an international geomagnetic initiative, and developing response, recovery, and risk plans at the national level and preparing the national infrastructure for the threat posed by polarity reversals. Mm hmm. I like that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, if you didn't know, the Earth's core is in the midst of significant change. During the last 400 years, the geomagnetic field or magnetosphere has declined in strength by a remarkable 40%. Mm -hmm. And that number certainly may be larger at this moment. Yeah, it's got to be 45 or higher. That's what I would say. So what's interesting is... The U.S. government and the European governments are in plain sight telling us that they're aware of the threat. ESA mm -hmm. Swarm was launched a few years ago with the direct mission is to monitor the sun and the Earth's magnetic field. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. And meanwhile, we're being told there's some climate emergency that we need to change everything about what we do for. So what is the purpose of that in light of the fact that the powers that be know this, that we are headed for a polarity reversal in all likelihood? And every day they they show us the data. It's the hottest this. It's the hottest that. But the magnetic field, the world magnetic model, is updated every five years. Right. <laughs> Which, given the exponential pace of things, right, like it's obviously woefully inac inadequate. <laughs> Not woefully adequate, but woefully inadequate. Right. So, <laughs> like we see here, measurements by ESA Swarm Geomagnetism Monitoring Satellite Array have further confirmed this change with measurements indicating the magnetic field is weakening 10 times faster than previously predicted. Mm -hmm. So the weakening trend in the magnetic field clearly shows that the Earth's core is undergoing a substantial transformation. I disagree with that statement and there is no <coughs> footnote. They're, they don't have a footnote to that statement. Mm. So we don't know. This is what the truth well, is. We don't, we don't really know anything core about of the Earth. We don't know anything about the core of the earth. So how can we, I don't, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, the, the part that this paper fails to recognize is that it's not earth in isolation, right? It's earth in relation to the sun and the rest of the solar system and the galaxy. And, uh, you know, if this person knew, let's say electric universe theory, they might not make a statement like that. I agree. Like, we don't know that it's the core that's causing it. We certainly can see how a weakening magnetosphere has a way of building upon itself, right? And that the weaker it gets, the more prone it's going to be to get weaker. You can, you can, you can kind of just conceptualize that by looking at a magnetic field model of the Earth. But we don't know that it has anything to do with the core specifically. What we do know is that the core has been slowing, and a recent peer-reviewed paper showed that just recently, maybe it was 2009, I don't recall the date, but the core actually spins in the same direction as the crust does. Mm -hmm. And they're usually synchronous, meaning they're spinning at the same rate, but sometimes the core spins a little faster. Right. And sometimes it spins a little slower and, and it has now spinning slower than the crust. It's not right. going backwards. People have claimed that the core reversed Nonsense. No, it it's the same. We're talking milliseconds here. And I think that maybe the weakening magnetosphere is what's slowing the spin of the core and not the opposite. They're, they're saying that the core controls the magnetosphere when it may be the exact opposite. I don't know how much it matters of the cause and effect necessarily. No, it doesn't. Right? Like it, it could very well be that it's it's that the the that the speed of the core spinning is a function of the uh, electromagnetism coming into Earth. Right? It could be something like that, and then that that feeds on itself, weakening the magnetosphere, and that it sort of kind of domino effects that way. But also, yes, the core doesn't reverse, right? It's like retrograde motion of planets. It just kind of appears that way because it's the relative motion of the two things next to each other. And it's just a millisecond slower. It's not like it's right. a great change. Right. This is like setting up a movie where we go to the center of the earth to speed up the core to save the world. <laughs> that ain't happening considering we've never even gotten through the crust. <laughs> yeah, but we can dream. Yeah. <laughs> now, the bad news is that Earth's geomagnetic field is responsible for both shielding the atmosphere and biosphere from the harmful effects of solar and cosmic radiation, which create conditions on the surface here that are safe and ripe for life. So the magnetosphere that we're talking about is the invisible barrier that has played a significant role in protecting Earth from the harmful effects of cosmic radiation. The importance of this shield is obvious when you compare Earth and Mars. Earth is a lush planet full of water and life, and Mars is barren, rocky desert with a very weak magnetic field. Right. So we need our magnetosphere. Which is so interesting to think about, like, 
you know, why is it, ex I mean, we sort of discussed this before, but why is it exactly that we have some planets that barely have a magnetic field at all? Like, how did that occur? What causes a planet to have a magnetic field in the first place, it's, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, we have so much we don't know. Yeah. But we, I'm, I'm sure we could gain a lot just by comparing and contrasting planets that have magnetic fields versus the, those that don't. But we're not studying any of this stuff. And by we, I mean, you know, well, there's a few general, planetary geologists stuff. out there doing the work, I'm sure. Sure, sure. But it's it's the same issue with that this that that this the author of this paper is raising that this is not something that we invest our our minds into and we really should. Here's what I find interesting that in the last let's say 5 years uh doing the show, I've come across a number of headlines that say things like the earth's magnetic field is shifting, but that doesn't mean it's bad. Or yeah. the Earth's magnetic field is weakening, but that doesn't mean it's a polarity reversal. We just reviewed an article about that last week. Yeah. And so, but the evidence is so overwhelming that we are in the middle of a geomagnetic excursion. How, what's going on? Right. Well, it's like normal sea bias, right? It's like, uh, it's, you know, tied in with this idea that everything on Earth is as it always was and it will always be the same. It's, it's that uniformitarianism mindset that this 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 thing that has happened in Earth's past, well, it can't possibly happen now in our lifetimes. You know, the same way that like we acknowledge somehow we acknowledge the history of ice ages, but we claim that that can't possibly happen again. And it's like, what? Yeah, it's very Cal farts are bad. We're all going to die. But the magnetosphere, which protects life on Earth, is weakening and that doesn't matter. Well, and here, here's part of why that's so wildly ridiculous, okay? As, again, as the author pointed out, it's like we know this has happened in the past because the evidence of that is very clear, that it will happen again. Um, but in reality, we know so little about the actual, if, I mean, we can we can hypothesize and theorize quite a lot and probably pretty accurately about what will happen, but in reality, we know so little, right? The author brings this little statistic up, which I think is kind of fascinating. Uh, geologists studying reversals are hampered by the time frame of accurate field measurements as well, which go back 400 years and represent less than one ten thousandth of a percent of the overall age of the earth at 4.6 billion years old, right? Like it's an indication of like how little we really know and how ridiculous it is to say something like, well, the magnetic field is weakening, but that can't possibly mean a reversal. And nor am I suggesting that a weakening magnetic field guarantees a polarity reversal because it's quite obvious that that's not the case either. But certainly excursions and reversals are on the table. Right. And it doesn't matter if it's, if it, if it, which it is, it's semantics. They both do the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> so yes. during an excursion, you can get all the way down to the bottom and all of the bad things happen. The well, decrease so that's Go ahead. That's, I mean, that is kind of a question, right? Because like, if, if you're going into a reversal, you're certainly going to hit a point where the, where the magnetic field strength is 90% less than it is now. And I presume that there's a moment where it's a hundred percent less, right? Like you hit the zero mark before the, right before the flip. Uh, an excursion doesn't necessarily mean that you will get down to 90% weakened field strength, but you are at least going to have severely weakened field strength, which has effect on Earth. Period. It can't really go to zero. We would be in space. Doesn't it have to at the moment of the flip, though? No, it's field strength. It's the strength of the whole field. So it diminishes as it flips, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it can't go to zero. Nothing would be alive. We yes, would be in yes. space. There would yes. be no magnetosphere. Yeah, understood. Yeah. So it gets very low, and the lowest I think they've ever recorded or estimated is around 5%, which is very bad. Yeah. It's yes. literally like space is a thousand feet away, and the amount of radiation it, coming in, you, you die if you're outside. Yeah, huge amounts of radiation, and at the same time, you have huge uh, atmospheric loss. 
you have loss of oxygen, you have loss of ozone, all of that. Yeah. And then can you imagine the ultraviolet radiation? You'd get a sunburn in like three seconds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So while, while, yeah, so let's go over it. The decrease in the magnetic field strength, regardless of it, if it's an excursion or a reversal, they do the same thing. They increase vulnerability to catastrophic space weather and increase cosmic and solar radiation interactions with the atmosphere and the surface, meaning you. Uh, this can lead to infrastructure damage in the trillions of dollars. I think that's a low estimate. <laughs> yeah. And yes. the death of untold numbers of people. Yes. Now, despite the danger posed by the magnetosphere decreasing in strength, geomagnetic polarity reversals have received no attention as a threat <laughs> to anyone. <laughs> and there is the elephant in the room. <laughs> Uh, this lack of research does not diminish the hazardous consequences a reversal would have on modern society. As such, they wrote this paper, and thank goodness they did. Um, let's talk about, so they talk about the origin of the geomagnetic field, which is a complete waste of time. It's fairy tale land. It, it's like, make up the story. You know, that's basically what mm -hmm. it is. Yeah. Like the, we thought the, like we're taught the earth has got all these concentric rings of things, the crust, the mantle, the asthenosphere, it's that the outer core, the inner core. It doesn't look like that. With tomography, we know that there's these huge low velocity zones. There's plumes that extend from the outer core to the crust. It, it's, we, what we think the earth is, is not what we see it as. <laughs> well, it's like, you know, probably, I don't know, 80 years ago, somebody came up with this model of what the inner earth looks like, even though we didn't know anything. And it just stuck because it seemed like a good explanation for the other things that we observe, right? And now we have new observation and evidence that hasn't been incorporated into that picture. So the textbooks, uh, ac the actual textbooks and, and the general textbook knowledge sort of remains the same, right? Exactly. Exactly. So it, the, the fairy tale is that there's a solid iron core and a liquid outer core and it mm -hmm. acts as a dynamo and it's spinning and it creates a magnetic field. Right. And probably it's the same thing as, as, as saying that the that the sun is, you know, an, an a thermonuclear reaction. Right, right, right. That's going to burn out someday. Right. I remember reading about that as a kid in some big sort of very illustrated encyclopedic book that we had or something, this idea that, the, you know, eventually the sun expands and it gets so large that it, it, it sucks up the rest of the solar system. And I, that really scared me. As a kid. <laughs> I was like, Oh no. <laughs> wow. All right. Let's bring it, bring us back to the topic here of geomagnetic polarity and the fact that the, the core inner and outer core probably don't create the magnetic field. And the reason I say that is because if you look at the geomagnetism back in geologic history, it is so varied. There is a yeah. time for like tens of millions of years where the field doesn't ever shift at all. Yeah. And there's like no explanation for it. And then there's times when the polarity is reversing every 30,000 years, bang, 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 bang. Yeah. No explanation for it. And now here we are. We haven't had a polarity reversal in 700,000 years. 780,000 years. I mean, it's actually 781. To... Yeah. So, and he has all of those stats right here, right? He says, during the last 40 million years alone, the field has flipped 143 times, which averages about uh, once every 250,000 years for the last 25 million years. Uh, and, but the last reversal was 780,000 years ago, right? But then also there's these long periods of time. I don't remember now how long where there's no reversal at all. Well, here in the Cretaceous. Yeah. Yeah. Here we can see from about it's, uh, 85 to 103. That yeah. is like 30 million years of not, no change in polarity. Which, but here, also during the Cretaceous, during this period here, mm -hmm. it, it reverses. Look at it. Like, look at during the Ordovician. 
This is 450 million years ago. The polarity was going bing, bong, bing, bong, bing, bong, bing, bong, bing, bong, bing, 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 bing. We have such high uh, resolution because there are so many of these turbidite deposits from the Ordovician all over the U.S. So we have huge outcrops of this time period. Yeah. Um, and there are volcanic eruptions. So you get the highest resolution magnetic data from a volcano that's erupting, let's say, for millions of years with mm -hmm. lava flow on top of lava flow. Right. You get exact magnetic measurements of the pole. And that's where most of these lines come from. Yeah. Yeah. Some of it comes from the sea floor survey when they first did it in the 50s, when they drug a, like a magnetometer across the seafloor and they noticed polarity reversals. Right. Which developed into plate tectonic theory. Right. Right. I mean, this this graph alone, you know, gives the lie to the idea that the Earth has always been the same, right? I mean, you and I ha are talking about even bigger Earth changes, like things like expanding Earth theory, right? That that the Earth has gone through periods of major expansion due to forces that we're not clear on at all. And just looking at the stark difference in periods of time in Earth's history in terms of the frequency of reversals... I mean, indicates that clearly the dynamics on Earth, whatever they were, were completely different than they are today. Yeah. And and based on the variability that we're looking at here, what they allude to in the paper, which is quite obvious, is there's no way to predict a polarity reversal because they're all unique. They're all different. They have they're different time frames, different scales. Right. And we don't even know it's in the center of the Earth. <laughs> let alone what the weather is in four days. Yeah, yeah. And that's something I really appreciate about this paper, again, in terms of like the scientific integrity and honesty is being very clear about how little we know and what we really don't understand. And what's Acknowledging very, that's really important. What's very clear is we are in the middle of a geomagnetic excursion right now. Yes. And that means bad things may be uh, happening soon. You know, it's funny because the article that we reviewed last week was talking about how uh, the South um, a South Atlantic anomaly, there's a big area of, of, of magnetic field anomaly that's been there for quite some time now. And they're like, well, that doesn't mean anything. And it's like, you, <laughs> you don't know that. You have no way of knowing that. And actually, it's pretty obvious that it is an in indication of an excursion, at least. Yes. Now let's go back to the last polarity reversal, the, the Matoyama Bruns transition. Uh, peer reviewed paper in 2014 showed that it completed itself in less than 100 years. Mm -hmm. And so if we're now in this excursion, which has been definitely, so the magnetic pole shift direction in 1860, right at the Carrington event, the right, Carrington right event kicked off a geomagnetic jerk and the North Geopole and the South Geopole started moving in different directions. Mm -hmm. They've been traveling in that direction ever since. Mm -hmm. So we've at least been in this excursion since 1859, which is over 150 years. Yeah. And so it, we may be, and based on some of the proje projections, at 5% strength by 2050. Wow. That's just, that's just two decades. Wow. And it doesn't have to be that low to get bad. Yeah. 20% yes. field strength would be devastating on Earth. Yes. Any geomagnetic storm would fry everything. It would be very bad. Yes. Plus the UVA, UVB, UVC reaching the surface. You know, this is funny. Um, for many years, I'd say a couple of decades, I've noticed a change in UV, right? Because I'm a very, very fair person. Uh, and I burn really easily. And over the like over the years, long time ago, I noticed this that I started burning faster than I used to. Oh. And the the explanation before I before I understood long ago what the lie was about global warming. You know, I would sort of in my head attribute it to like, oh well, you know, because I wasn't paying attention to the the, the science the, or the lack of science as far as global warming stuff. And I'd say, oh, it's a result of there's less ozone in the atmosphere, et cetera. But it may very well be a function of an excursion and lowering yeah. magnetic field strength. And also people have noticed the change in color of the sun from yellow hmm. to white. Yeah, that one I never really noticed. Hmm. 
The question, when will the next polar reversal occur, is that no one knows, but there's strong evidence that suggests that we are in a geomagnetic excursion uh, with field strength levels during the last 150 to 200 years dropping by a significant 15%. <laughs> and if you want to know where to get the specific data, you could just Google the World Magnetic Model, and they sometimes do annual updates because of the shifting magnetic field is so rapid, they have to do annual updates or else planes wouldn't be landing on the correct runways and things like that. So, right, right. Or ships would hit icebergs and, and islands, right? Yeah. So they have to update it. And so the 2023 annual update is the most recent update you can get. And it's sobering. It's not, it doesn't say everything is fine. It's so bizarre that they do this. But they have a whole entry for the South Atlantic anomaly. Yeah. Yeah, they talk about how it's decreasing in strength. <clears throat> they also talk about how the the pole, the North Magnetic Pole, is moving at an average speed of 41 kilometers per year. Ah, that's just normal. <laughs> <laughs> Which means it will circumnavigate the Earth in a few decades. Like, that. that's something to behold there. Yeah. Yeah. The South Magnetic uh, dip pole is moving a little slower at just nine kilometers per year. So that's even more bizarre. We've got one pole traveling four times faster in a, than the other pole. And they're both headed towards the equator. Well, and, and that to me, it's, it's like an indication of weakness of the field, right? Because a strong field is going to have negative and positive, like at the, perfect 180 degree opposite places right so now we've got one polarity is kind of like wacky over here and the other one's over here which is just an indication of the the weakness of the field yeah right? like a, a magnet with polarity that's not at the complete opposite ends is not going to be a strong magnet i didn't prove this is a huge document my goodness yeah. yeah yeah so we'll link you to all this below and you can keep up with the annual or five year updates because they're so often mm -hmm. also has the current position of the dip poles here in mm -hmm. the, in the graph where you can see this is the South pole, which is now way away from the South rotational pole. Mm -hmm. And this is the North pole, which happens to actually be near the rotational pole for the first time in a long time. Yeah. So yeah. That's kind of interesting. And does this show, um, I mean, we've talked in the past that there's been periods of times where it's almost like we have, like, I think it was two, almost like two south magnetic poles almost. Yeah, so, right, there is there is here, on the left side here, by Canada, where it, there appears to be a remnant north pole. That was where the pole was before it started moving in 1859. Yeah. So because it stayed over there for hundreds of years, the magnetic field is still focused on that area, even though over the last 150 years, the pole has raced towards Siberia, mm -hmm. the major magnetism is still remnant over the Canadian shield. Mm -hmm. So it appears as if there's two North Poles because of the rapid pulling apart of the actual dipole. Right, right. Yeah, yeah it's At interesting At some point, that will fade. Huh? After hundreds or thousands of years, that other pole will fade. Yeah, it's interesting how magnetism kind of leaves an artifact behind, you know, that that takes time to dissipate. And if it stays there long enough, it's a bigger artifact. Yeah. So we know this is happening. The uh, the media isn't really talking about it. Of course not. Because we're all supposed to be terrified because, of climate change. Maybe it's because there's a mandate. You yeah. don't want to scare the public. Let's not bring this up. But but they do scare the public on a regular basis. I mean, we <laughs> and and that's that's something that's been uh, sought after, right? We we talked about this recently, where it's like we're literally purposely creating a, a culture of anxiety around something that's not even happening, meaning global. Well, maybe warming. it's on purpose, the disinformation, because all the things that would happen in a climate catastrophe occur during magnetic excursions. Right. So you and I have talked about this many times in the past. Like we've hypothesized that that it's it's like um 
a bait and switch almost. It's like, oh, let's tell people to be scared of this thing over here. And then by doing that, we're going to we're going to pull all of the remaining wealth out of the population by scaring the crap out of them, by taxing them to death, um, by telling them that they have to like stay home and lock down and all of that stuff. Meanwhile, we're really getting prepared for uh, a different catastrophe. And by pulling all of the resources from the general population, we will be well prepared. Amen. So what are we looking what are we looking at here? What's going to happen? Do we need helmets? Do we need space suits? <laughs> I think we need a lot more than that. <laughs> you certainly need to be self-sufficient and to find and secure your own food. Yeah. So that's the key because you'll die without food and water. Yeah. You also need shelter. If we have a weak magnetosphere, you can't live outside. You will die. Yeah. It's better to be underground or inside a metal building with a roof. Stay mm -hmm. inside during the day when the sun is out. That's, that mm -hmm. is the creator of the radiation. So when it's directly facing you, we know now if you go outside, you get a sunburn. It's kind of bad. Yeah. But with a weak magnetosphere going down below 20%, it's really bad. Yeah. So do stuff at night if you need to go outside or at dusk or when the sun sets or before the sun comes up. Calm, that's just common sense. You know, it's funny because this paper, that that element, the effect on the biosphere in general, this is the one area where the author, I think, really didn't fully explore the effects of a weak uh, magnetosphere, uh, magnetic field um, on on biological life. Like it talks about like higher incidences of skin cancer and like one other thing. And you're like, um, I think the effects of all of that radiation is going to be far more than just skin cancer. It's very <laughs> bizarre. Yeah. Um, it's I mean, going to result in the law and the death of 90% of human population. Right. I'm, and, and we've seen that, that uh, major extinctions have occurred around polarity reversals in the past. Yes, um, and we'll show, we'll show some of that data in a second here. But what they conclude is uh, increased amounts of energetic particles interacting with the atmosphere will decrease ozone, of course. Yeah. It will allow more solar and cosmic radiation to interact at the planet's surface and the biosphere. The results from the larger cosmic and solar particles interact with the atmosphere will be reduced ozone and reduced oxygen in the upper atmosphere increased radiation exposure at the surface especially at high latitudes now the bad news is that a paper coming out showed that it's not high latitudes it could be as low as 40 degrees that's where we are that's texas that's where everyone lives everyone yeah, lives well, between 40 and 50 degrees that's where everyone lives well, and actually this paper is saying that it would get down to 30 degrees. Yeah, so that's near the equator. Yeah. Cuba. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the effects are massive. And a 20% UVB radiation increase in those latitudes. And, and, and this, this is just for the biome. It's not actually discussing the initial effects. As we are reaching this point, at some point, a geomagnetic storm is going to fry things on Earth. As we are reaching this point, bad things begin to happen, which already collapse society. Yes, yes. Well, actually, it is discussed in here a, a few times um, as far as like the, the increasing effect of solar events on Earth based on a weakened magnetic field that, you know, he'll, he'll talk about what would happen right now and then like well and then you throw in the fact that the magnetic field is ex much weaker and it's completely devastating yeah you know to electrical infrastructure to communications infrastructure um it it's funny because he'll talk about um uh the effects on the electrical grid and how many um extremely high voltage transformers would would get blown out, for example, I mean, how long and how expensive it would take to replace those things. But at the same time, like another, another section, he'll talk about 
um, how affected emergency responses would be, but forgetting to account for the electrical effects that have already occurred that are going to prevent uh, recovery services from doing anything at all, right? I'll I'll talk about you know the effect on uh, the electrical grid, but then separately talk about the effect on, let's say, airplanes, let's say the radiation. But it's like, okay, those those airplanes aren't going to be flying anyway. No, the pilots would be dead. Well, but also there's no electricity, right? Like, I mean, once you start blowing up the main extremely high voltage transformers, you're it, it's not going to work to do any recovery using generators. Like, the, it's not, you know what I mean? There's not going to be really any options left. Right, so, and as we're decreasing and we do get a grid frying event and you're spending three years to make new transformers, it's going to happen again. It's getting weaker. Well, right, and that's the other thing, right? There's the, the, the point. There's no point in doing any of the recovery work dur- during the process of a reversal because the effects are going to be even worse. You can fix stuff, but it's going to break again, I promise. Unless they do it correctly and they harden it, which it can't right. be affected, which is the right. way it should be. So maybe this would be a wake-up call for humanity on doing things differently the next time. I I, I actually don't think that there's <laughs> even going to be an opportunity for that. Yeah. Like the, the cascade of effects that lead to other effects is so massive. And you do get a sense of that when you when you read the effects like in in various different areas as this paper sort of breaks it down you can sort of start putting all of that together and see how it lays on top of each other and how catastrophic the cascade really is um, but yes. I, I just i don't think we're going to get the opportunity to like fix this in the process i think it's way too destructive and we're so woefully unprepared yeah and you can see on this chart how often this occurs this is the last 300,000 years the yellow lines are some of the well-known excursions that have biosphere effects. And so we could see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, at least 10 in the last 300,000 years. Yeah. Periodicity of about 30K there. And you could see the last one was the Younger Dryas event. Mm-hmm. And you could see we're going straight down now into the next excursion. Yeah. We're already as low as the Mono Lake excursion. Yeah. I mean, that's why it's crazy that this is not in the paper. This is not in textbooks. We're not teaching people because we have all of this information. Well, I mean, maybe part of the reason why we're not talking about this is that like even from the high point that we're falling from as in terms of magnetic field strength, we're that even that high point is way lower than what the magnetic field strength was roughly like 19,000 years ago on this graph. You know, so we're not comparing it to where we were, where we were before. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's interesting that this high field strength you're pointing out 20,000 years ago, that might coincide if we're correct with the the peak of the golden air age, Atlantis, oh, yeah. the the, yeah. the megalith. And then they all disappeared on this drop down. So that's that's what we're talking about. We're talking about at the end of a global empire where there's no evidence of it afterwards, right. except a few things. Right, right. But it makes you think like empires here on earth, we rise during warm periods like the Roman warm and the Minoan warm. What if the magnetic field has an even bigger strength on human potential? Yeah, no, I can I can completely imagine that. And it would I mean, it would help explain this concept of that we go through periods high high periods of culture and technology and human thinking. Although the only problem with that idea, like if if it aligns with the yuga cycle, a 26,000 year cycle, this the this there is no real pattern here to reversals and excursions, right? So it doesn't fit in real well that way. It's highly variable. Yeah. But the the up and down here, the ups and downs here are averaging about 6,000 years. 6,000, 6,000. See, up and down, up and down, mm-hmm. up and down. Mm-hmm. It's about every 6,000 years, which coincides with that cosmic catastrophe clock. Six, six is 12. Two 12s is 24. That's about mm-hmm. a processional mm-hmm. cycle. So there may be a signal there, but it's it's not obvious. Yeah. 
Yeah. There's so many factors that go into these things that there's just not one mechanism driving it all. I don't believe that. Yeah. Well, and the other thing is that, and, and I think the author of this paper that we've been discussing even alludes to this, that when you think about sort of what's happening when you have magnetic, a magnetic field weakening, like it, it does seem very amorphous and not patterned and not particularly predictable, you know? Yeah. It's highly erratic here. You can see yeah. the field strength on the right through the last 70,000 years. It's just erratic. There's, there's maybe this sim signal here, but that is the, what, what I'm showing you. That is about a processional cycle every up and down. It's about yeah. 26,000, another 26,000. Yeah. So yeah. that could be the cycle. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> wow, man, we have so much to talk about and not enough time. Never enough time. Find us tonight on Magnetic Reversal News at 8 p.m. Check out our sponsor, Alliance of Native Sea Keepers, link below. Radio at freedomslips.com. We'll be right back after this message.